Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 84. No mistakes, no hardship, no failures, no successes. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we get knocked down, get back up, dust ourselves off, get back to work, and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. As we settle into the new year with hopefully a slightly new and improved daily routine, I always think it's a good idea to take a few minutes and go over in our heads our relationship with mistakes, hardship, or failures. It is a relationship, you know, and the better we can understand it and how those few words we try to avoid, for some at all costs, are the critical stepping stones to our future successes. No mistakes, no hardship, No failures, no successes. For most of my life, I've tried to sidestep or elude mistakes. I guess we've been programmed to stay clear of miscues. I mean, think about times as a kid. When you were in school, on the rink, at home with our parents, what's going on? In school, we learn some new things, take a test, and get feedback on our mistakes. On the rink, we practice, we play games, but think about the majority of the feedback we get from coaches is when we make a mistake and they give us suggestions on how to do things differently next time so, you guessed it, you don't make the same mistake again. Today I have a completely different relationship with mistakes, struggle, and miscues. What was something I tried to avoid whenever I could, I've now accepted as part of the process and now, if challenges aren't present from time to time during the day, I know I'm not on the right road to have a chance to get to the really good stuff, success. One example for me is these solo podcasts I've been doing. Here's my process. I'll pick a topic which in most cases is prompted by an experience a player I'm training or one of my boys is going through, and I'll do an episode on it. Once the topic is set, I'll construct the script, which is usually five to seven pages with large font. Coach's eyes can't see the little letters no more. When the script is far enough along, I'll start recording, like I'm doing now, and let the rest of the script evolve over the course of a day or two as I'm constantly revisiting it, trying to add a sentence or two. Here's where I had to accept mistakes for what they are, and what's cool is that now when I make a mistake when recording, the moment it happens, I know I just made some progress. Once I hit record, all I try to do is get two to three sentences laid down, there's a miscue, stop the recording, edit the clip, listen to make sure it's good, hit save, and move on to the next group of words. Hit record, start reading, mistake happens, stop recording, repeat. That's what I do until it's completed, and I don't mind mistakes anymore. It's funny, once I changed my relationship with hiccups or adversity that pop up here and there, they really don't bother me anymore in any aspect of my life. It's a game I like to play with myself now. The challenge presents itself, how fast can I address it and put it behind me? I kind of like my relationship with mistakes. We're pals now. If I could take Mr. Mistake to a movie, I would and I'd pay because you're awesome once in a while and I know growth is soon to follow once you come around saying hi. What's your current relationship with mistakes, adversity, and negative thinking? We can never turn off certain types of thoughts whenever we want. Our mind is constantly oscillating with thoughts that inspire, and others, not so much. It's figuring out what a normal functioning brain looks like when undesirable thoughts start taking over, 
what strategies, practices, or techniques can be learned and used to disrupt the vampire-sucking thought and replace it with a productive one. You know I love to read, and I'd like to share with you a few books and related quotes that may get you thinking a little differently about your relationship with mistakes, self-sabotaging thoughts, and negative thinking in order to increase the likelihood of totally crushing your short and long-term goals. For the following books I'm going to reference, know that I'm only scratching the surface of all the learning nuggets and goodness from each of the titles. If one connects with you by the end of this episode, I highly recommend you pick up a copy of your own and read it in its entirety. I'll put the links to all the books in the description. With that being said, let's begin. Book number one, The Psychology of Winning, 10 Qualities of a Total Winner by Dennis Waitley. Quote number one, the term winning may sound phony to you, too materialistic, too full of A's or luck or odds or muscle-bound athletes. True winning, however, is no more than one's own personal pursuit of individual excellence. You don't have to knock other people down or gain at the expense of others. Winning is taking the talent and potential you were born with and have since developed and using it fully toward a goal or purpose that makes you happy. End quote. Quote number two. How are you taking it? The most important single point in the chapters to follow, to remember and internalize, is that it makes little difference what is actually happening. It's how you personally take it that really counts. End quote. Quote number three. An inventory bag. Take inventory of your good reasons for self-esteem today. Write down what your bag is, capital B, capital A, capital G. Capital B, blessings. Who and what are you thankful for? Capital A, accomplishments. What you have done that you're proud of so far. And capital G, goals. What your dreams and ambitions are. End quote. Quote number four, stay on target and score a hit. Every winner I have ever met knows where he or she is going day by day, every day. Winners are goal-oriented. They set and get what they want consistently. They are self-directed on the road to fulfillment. Fulfillment or success has been defined as the progressive realization of goals that are worthy of the individual. The human system is goal-seeking by design and, using a very basic analogy, may be compared to a homing torpedo system or automatic pilot. Set your target and the self-activated system, constantly monitoring feedback signals from the target area and adjusting course settings in its own navigational guidance computer makes every correction necessary to stay on target and score a hit. Programmed incompletely, non-specifically, or aimed at a target too far out of range, the homing torpedo will wander erratically around until its propulsion system fails or self-destructs. And so it is with each individual human system in life. Keep this in mind as well. One of the best ways to develop adaptability to the stresses of life is to view them as normal. Earl Nightingale tells of his visit with his son recently to the Great Barrier Reef, which stretches nearly 1,800 miles from New Guinea to Australia. Noticing that the coral polyps on the inside of the reef, where the sea was tranquil and quiet in the lagoon, appeared pale and lifeless, while the coral on the outside of the reef, subject to the surge of the tide and power of the waves, were bright and vibrant with splendid colors and flowing growth. Earl Nightingale asked why this is so. It's very simple, came the reply. The coral on the lagoon side dies rapidly with no challenge for growth and survival while the coral facing the surge and power of the open sea thrives and multiplies because it is challenged and tested every day. And so it is with every living organism on earth. End quote. Bonus quote number five. How's your motive? Motivation is a much maligned, over-franchised, over-promoted, and misunderstood term. The word motive is defined as that within the individual, rather than outside, 
which incites him or her to action, an idea, need, emotion, or organic state that prompts to action. Motivation is a force which moves us to action, and it springs from inside the individual. End quote. Bonus quote number six, butterflies and moths. When you get butterflies in your stomach before a performance, accept them as butterflies. Butterflies are nice. When they start to eat you, they're like moths. Moths in your stomach are not nice. They cause ulcers. Positive tension produced by desire is like a bow pulled taunt to propel an arrow to the bullseye. In a totally tension-free state, you are either comatose or dead. Viktor Frankl, noted psychiatrist and founder of the psychotherapeutic school known as Logotherapy, flatly states that what a person actually needs is not a tensionless state, but the striving and struggle for a goal that is worthy of him or her. End quote. Bonus quote number seven. Personal optimism and enthusiasm. The most readily identifiable quality of a total winner is an attitude of personal optimism and enthusiasm. End quote. Bonus quote number eight. Concentrate all your energy. Concentrate all your energy and intensity without distraction on the successful completion of your current project. Finish what you start. End quote. And bonus quote number nine. Planning our ideal lives. Most people spend more time planning a party, studying the newspaper, or making a Christmas list than they do planning their lives. End quote. Book number two, Toughness Training for Life, a revolutionary program for maximizing health, happiness, and productivity by James E. Lohr. Quote number one, stress management systems usually aim at reducing stress, an unrealistic goal for most of us. This book shows you how to toughen up so you can handle more stress and be healthier, happier, and more productive. Tough takes on a new meaning in these pages. Not James Dean squinting over cigarette smoke, not street punks and black leather, but nice guys and gals who know how to lead happy, productive, healthy lives. Toughness Training for Life is a system of thinking, feeling, doing, and living that offers practical ways to solve some of life's most challenging problems. It represents a new generation of thought. End quote. Quote number two, let's make some waves. Making waves is another term for the same concept of balancing between the stress and recovery cycles we've been discussing. Whether we express it as day and night, peaks and valleys, or ebb and flow, the reoccurring themes of toughening always involve dynamic movement, expansion of challenge, change, growth, oscillation, and rhythm alternating with rest and recovery. End quote. Quote number three, how toughening happens. There are four types of stress and only one leads to toughening. Excessive stress and insufficient stress actually decrease toughness, while maintenance stress freezes it at current levels. Only adaptive stress toughens. We get tougher by progressively challenging ourselves beyond our normal limits. He advises, in sport, the greatest risk is physical overtraining and emotional overtraining. In non-sport life, it's physical undertraining and emotional overtraining. End quote. Quote number four, the time between points. Much of what I understand about the importance of recovery in life evolved initially from a two-and-a-half-year study of how top professional tennis players manage stress during competition. I wanted to identify the acquired habits of thinking and acting that help mentally tough competitors manage stress so effectively. I was convinced that if I looked closely enough, I could isolate the elements of mental toughness. However, months of intense study and analysis revealed few significant differences between the thoughts or actions of top competitors and poor competitors while the ball was in play. This came as a surprise, to say the least. 
Not until I began a rigorous study of between point time did I discover dramatic differences. I soon saw that top competitors and poor competitors thought and acted very differently between points. Here's how Lohr puts it. All the data indicated that tough competitors, unlike non-tough ones, maximized their opportunities for recovery between points. They had acquired a highly refined and precise system of trained recovery. In contrast, poor competitors were less disciplined, less exact, less realistic, and more varied in their actions between points. They were also much more likely to express negative emotion each time they made a mistake. When angry, frustrated, disappointed, irritated, or discouraged, they were far more likely to show it. He tells us trained recovery is the foundation of toughness both in life and in sport. If you want to get tougher, the requirements are few and simple. Learn how to make powerful waves of recovery as well as powerful waves of stress. End quote. Bonus quote number five, Altradian Rhythms. Biological rhythms called Altradians pulse through us every 90 to 120 minutes. Circadians pulse every 24 hours. Rossi believes that continuously overriding the body's natural occurring Altradian and Circadian cycles of stress and rest can lead to a host of serious physical and emotional problems. These problems include everything from chronic fatigue to weakening the immune system and from depression to poor performance. Altradian and circadian researchers refer to the habit of ignoring the body's need for rest and recovery as endurance stress. Breaking cycles of stress every 90 to 120 minutes with 15 to 20 minutes of recovery fits the body's natural needs best, Rossi reports. According to Rossi, these 15 to 20 minute rest breaks restore proper ultradian rhythms and, in doing so, are critical to physical and psychological rejuvenation and long-term health. End quote. Bonus quote number six, physiological recovery equals huge. Tending to our body's needs for physiological recovery should always be our first priority. Unfortunately, as we become increasingly more stressed, we neglect our body's basic needs for food, sleep, exercise, and relaxation. End quote. Bonus quote number seven, the phone is ringing. Negative emotions are like a phone ringing in your body. Don't block the call. Instead, Give it a clear line into your brain. When negative emotions start surfacing and your internal feelings phone is ringing, pick it up. A ringing phone indicates a need for recovery. Minor needs are signaled by soft rings, that is, by light negative emotions or feelings. You feel mildly irritated, hungry, tired, bored, or something similar. Urgent needs are signaled by loud, painful rings by strong negative emotions such as intense fear, anger, depression, hopelessness, exhaustion, or something else with similar impact. The feelings and emotions you're hearing are stress recovery talk. Work at learning the skill of understanding and interpreting the meaning of negative emotions. A ringing phone, your awareness of negative emotion, serves a critical role. If you don't get the message and respond in ways that fulfill the need, the phone will continue to ring. It will get louder and louder, cause you more and more pain as time goes on without the need being met. End quote. Bonus quote number eight. Physical plus mental toughness equals emotional toughness. Although emotions are genuine biochemical events, they are not easily accessible. Emotional training for the challenge response occurs in two ways. One, outside in, from the muscles inward to the brain. And number two, inside out, from the brain outward through thinking and perceiving. Although we don't have direct voluntary control of our emotions, we can exercise considerable control over what we do with our physical bodies as well as the direction and content of our thoughts. Physical toughness and mental toughness together produce emotional toughness. This understanding forms the basis of toughness training. End quote. 
And bonus quote number nine, give me stress, I need the practice. Chances are you have already suffered some hard emotional knocks. You may feel you've paid your dues in this regard. Sadly, it doesn't work that way. More emotional pain will come into your life and mine too. The only question is, when? A major life crisis is simply a massive dose of stress. If your range of coping is quite limited, a sudden life crisis can swiftly push you beyond your limits into the gray zone where people do destructive things to themselves. That's why it's important to always consider yourself in training to get physically and emotionally stronger. Keep in mind that the question is never if rough times will come, but simply when and what they will be. In a real sense, every day of our lives represents another opportunity to get tougher and to expand our capacity for coping. I urge you to put this concept to work for you. Give me stress. I need the practice. End quote. And book number three, The Ultra Mindset. An endurance champion's eight core principles for success in business, sports, and life. By Travis Macy. Quote number one. That's the purpose of this book, to help you achieve your goals, whether they are in racing or in life, by sharing with you a few of the principles that have held me in good stead as I've logged my ultra miles through forests, deserts, and jungles. Are you looking to compete your first marathon or century bike ride? Are you trying to qualify for Boston? Are you training for your first triathlon or ultra or charity 5K walk? Maybe you're trying to summon the courage to launch a new business or enter a new career. Perhaps you just want to become a better parent, spouse, friend, person. This book is about the Leadville Race Series and mountain biking in China and running across Utah and kayaking in Sweden and a whole lot more because my experiences in these venues show that people really can accomplish whatever they commit to. I hope you'll find my racing stories interesting and maybe even entertaining. But primarily, they are vehicles to deliver tangible, actionable principles that are relevant to you and your endeavors. Principles that have steeled me, supported me, and guided me through some very long and arduous miles in very faraway places and difficult circumstances. Principles that I call the Ultra Mindset. End quote. Quote number two, your new mantra, it's all good mental training. The idea here is that challenges are part of life. Viewing them as positive, even essential, instruments of mental training can build, pebble by pebble, a mountain of inner resilience that will allow you to complete anything to which you are deeply committed. These challenges and this mental training, moreover, when experienced through pursuits of choice, generate an incredible well of resolve that allows us all to persevere through the truly challenging, the mandatory bouts of suffering dished out by life. What do you choose to pursue? End quote. Quote number three. You've run 60 miles, 40 more to go. Feel like it? When I have already run 60 miles and have 40 more to go, do I feel like running 40 more? I love running. But of course, I don't feel like running 40 more miles after running 60. No one does. However, I have reached the point where my self-control is such that, unless I'm suffering a serious physical injury that prevents me from taking a step, I know I'm not going to stop. I know I'm going to continue on for 40 miles, come hell or high water. End quote. Quote number four. Thinking about our thinking. We know this. We know the inevitability of highs and lows. And yet, when we find ourselves buffeted by these ups and downs, we often seem unprepared. We're either flushed with overconfidence and almost unsustainable euphoria, or dashed on the rocks of depression. Why is this? Why do we let ourselves get caught in the tides like an unprepared swimmer? Because we don't think about our thinking. Thinking ahead about how you will think, how you will react when those highs and lows come along is a key to success in both racing and life, particularly when you think about what you will be doing at a given time and why you will be doing it. End quote. 
Bonus quote number five, make the choice to give up choice. The 4.30 a.m. rule is not just about waking up early to get more in during the day as dad did. That's part of it, of course, but there's something deeper here. The point of this mindset, simply put, is that when you have committed to something ahead of time, you don't worry about whether you actually feel like taking action when it's time to spring into action. When the alarm goes off at 4.30 a.m., you must get up and get going, even and especially when you feel like rolling over and going back to sleep. The rule does not have to be taken literally. Getting up at 4.30 a.m. is just an example of the kind of stick to it it takes to succeed. The rule you apply to your own situation may be slightly different or may involve doing a particular thing at some other time of the day or at some specific time each week. The point is, you make a prior commitment to yourself and in doing so, make the choice to give up choice. Committing to something, a training program, a project, a job, a relationship, caring for a child is one of the most important things you can do in life. This is where it starts. By committing to 4.30 a.m., literally or figuratively, you have relinquished other options. Getting up at a time when few others do can be the first step toward achieving the goal. End quote. Bonus quote number six. Where's your next aid station? 100 miles? That's a long way to run. Heck, it's a long way to drive. It would be like running from Philadelphia to New York City and then doing three miles around Central Park for good measure. If you're going to run such a distance, you sure as heck better break it into manageable chunks. Particularly, since this was my first 100 mile run, my general plan was to start conservatively, not get caught up in the racing early on, and tackle the course step by step, focusing on getting to the next aid station rather than worrying about the entire course. End quote. And bonus quote number seven, never quit, except when you should quit. Here's what it comes down to. If you're doing something you really care about, something you know aligns with your true self and highest purposes in life, never quit because you fear what will happen if you continue. Fear will be there, and that's this part of the deal. Keep going anyway. Failure is the worst possible outcome, and that's not all too bad, given that everyone who puts himself out there is bound to fail, often regularly, on the path to success. Finishing lead man aligned with who I want to be and how I want to spend my life, so quitting was not an option. On the other hand, if you are doing something you come to know is incongruent with your true self and highest purposes, odds are that you are continuing to do it because fear tells you not to quit. You're afraid of what will happen if you quit or because other people tell you to keep going, or because making money has somehow become more important than being happy, or because you made a decision long ago to pursue a certain path and can't come to grips with changing your mind. If you are doing something with your life that you don't want to do, then quit. True courage is overcoming fear and spending your life in what you believe to be a purposeful manner. A year and a half later, I joke with friends that I'm proud to be a dropout after quitting the principal licensure program. The truth is much more serious. I'm damn glad I quit something I was doing out of fear that would have set me up for a life I didn't want. End quote. Lots of wisdom, goodness, and many things to think about as we continue to work on creating the best version of ourselves, tinkering at it day after day after day. Anything jump out at you and really connected? Here's a favorite of mine from each of the titles that I'm going to give a quick reread and then I'll send you on your way. From book number one, The Psychology of Winning, 10 Qualities of a Total Winner by Dennis Waitley. Quote number three, an inventory bag. Take inventory of your good reasons for self-esteem today. Write down what your bag is. Capital B, capital A, capital G. Capital B, blessings. Who and what are you thankful for? Capital A, accomplishments. What you have done that you're proud of so far. And capital G, goals. What your dreams and ambitions are. 
End quote. From book number two, Toughness Training for Life, a revolutionary program for maximizing health, happiness, and productivity by James E. Luer. This comes from bonus quote number nine. Give me stress, I need the practice. Chances are you have already suffered some hard emotional knocks. You may feel you paid your dues in this regard. Sadly, it doesn't work that way. More emotional pain will come into your life and mine too. The only question is, when? A major life crisis is simply a massive dose of stress. If your range of coping is quite limited, a sudden life crisis can swiftly push you beyond your limits into the gray zone where people do destructive things to themselves. That's why it's important to always consider yourself in training to get physically and emotionally stronger. Keep in mind that the question is never if rough times will come, but simply when and what they will be. In a real sense, every day of our lives represents another opportunity to get tougher and to expand our capacity for coping. I urge you to put this concept to work for you. Give me stress. I need the practice. End quote. And from book number three, The Ultra Mindset. An Endurance Champion's Eight Core Principles for Success in Business, Sports, and Life by Travis Macy. This comes from bonus quote number five. Make the choice to give up choice. The 4.30 a.m. rule is not just about waking up early to get more in during the day, as Dad did. That's part of it, of course, but there's something deeper here. The point of this mindset, simply put, is that when you have committed to something ahead of time, you don't worry about whether you actually feel like taking action when it's time to spring into action. When the alarm goes off at 4.30 a.m., you must get up and get going, even and especially when you feel like rolling over and going back to sleep. The rule does not have to be taken literally. Getting up at 4.30 a.m. is just an example of the kind of stick to it it takes to succeed. The rule you apply to your own situation may be slightly different or may involve doing a particular thing at some other time of the day or at some specific time each week. The point is, you make a prior commitment to yourself and, in doing so, make the choice to give up choice. Committing to something, a training program, a project, a job, a relationship, caring for a child, is one of the most important things you can do in life. This is where it starts. By committing to 4.30 a.m., literally or figuratively, you have relinquished other options. Getting up at a time when few others do can be the first step toward achieving the goal. End quote. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed this edition. No mistakes, no hardship, no failures, no successes. If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.